Isabel, thank you for such a warm welcome. Uh, thanks also to colleagues in Kermit, in the School of Music, um, and the conference organizers for, for such a, uh, a generous invitation to come. So as Isabel mentioned, I'm uh, Aaron Willeman. I'm head of the Center for Performance Science at the Royal College of Music. If you travel to London and you find yourself in Kensington with your back to the Royal Albert Hall, this is what you'll see. That's the Royal College of Music. And if you look very, very closely, you'll find our Center for Performance Science. So we do occasionally come out of our tower and interact with the, the 800 musicians who study at the RCM. Uh, one of the very exciting developments in the past 12 months is that we've been building a very close relationship with our colleagues at Imperial College. Uh, next door to us in London, and in fact, from this year onwards, our Center for, for Performance Science will be a joint RCM Imperial College Center. So what does this mean? It means that our aims are to measure and analyze performance, and going beyond these basic fundamental uh, uh, areas of research, we also look to enhance performance. And in terms of performance, we take a very broad definition. We look at performance of experts. We also look at performance of novices and how they acquire and develop their skills. We are looking at performance as an exceptional instance of human cognition, perception, uh, and motor achievement. But we also look at everyday performance, performance in the workplace. We take a decidedly interdisciplinary approach into how we study performance. And in terms of our interdisciplinary themes, we, we can look at aspects of performance, learning uh, from an educational, a psychological point of view, also in terms of performance physiology, uh, technology, and performance economy. But we cut across these areas to see how performance can be studied across the arts business, education, medicine, science, and sport. The point is that if we do a project that for some reason, um, and for very good reasons, will make a combination of, say, education, physiology, psychology, and technology, and we're doing it in music, then we are motivated and incentivized to try to see where the outcomes of our research may generalize to other performance domains. And very often in our work, we're taking what we know from other fields and drawing it back into music as well. Uh, let me give you a few examples of how this works. So one of the projects that I run in the UK is called um, Musical Impact. And this is um, a project of Conservatoires UK. This is a consortium of the nine leading conservatoires in Britain. The project sets out to enhance the health and well-being of musicians who are working and studying in the UK. And what we decided as well, usually conservatoires, uh, especially in such a small geographical area, are constantly at each other's throats. Uh, we're constantly competing. Uh, but when it comes to the health and well-being of our students and our staff, we decided that this is an area where we need to pull together to collaborate and do something constructive. So we made an argument to the Arts and Humanities Research Council to say that, in fact, the health and well-being of musicians in the UK directly affects the health and well-being of the, of, of the cultural life of the UK. And the Research Council bought that argument, and they gave us about a million pounds to research over the next uh, four years to uh, investigate and develop that more. T at this point, what we've done is we've run health screening and fitness screening tests with over 500 musicians. We're doing very detailed uh, uh, studies of the energy expenditure while on stage and in the practice room, how that translates perhaps into injuries and ill health, and also where people are doing good things to, to promote good health in their music making. Uh, one of the outcomes of this project is that we've just this year inaugurated a so-called Healthy Conservatoires Network. This is where our members who are members of our conservatoires who are working across our institutions can meet twice a year to share best practice. And it's very similar to other initiatives in the UK, the Healthy Universities Network, and there are many, many similar uh, programs in, in the US and Canada that, that do the same thing. It's, it's uh, the fundamental principle is, is around a settings-based approach, that health and well-being is about 
the whole, the whole environment, the whole person, where people are, are doing their work, where they're studying, and how they're doing it. And the rationale that we've used for coming up with a separate healthy conservatoires network as opposed to the healthy universities network is that the way in which musicians learn and perform is decidedly different from the way other students in universities learn and perform. I give a very good example that many of our students will give their final exams in front of 200 people, whereas the physics students next door to us at Imperial College do not take their exams in front of 200 people. They do, they, they have to solve 200 equations, but that's a very different task altogether. Um, so we have a number of projects across our new center uh, that bubble up from the bottom where we take issues of performance and try to investigate them systematically. What we've also tried to do is to set ourselves some grand challenges. Where does performance and performance science directly interact and impact with society? We, we've done this um, with pioneering work with assistive technology. Uh, we have, I have a colleague in bioengineering at Imperial who is working um, uh, with, with video and uh, video data and, and cap, uh, uh, cameras to provide assistance for visually impaired people in terms of how to navigate their environments and how to move around uh, central London. Uh, w one of the projects in terms of a grand challenge that we're working on within music is music health and well-being. So we've heard already today a number of instances where music is actually in addition to being a, a, a ubiquitous activity, it is a very important activity for enhancing health and well-being. In a lot of the work that we're doing in a conservatoire, we're focusing on making music as a way to enhance health and well-being. We've been working with people um, uh, in different groups, including uh, older adults. We've just started, we're starting a new project across the UK, Switzerland and Japan, looking at the extent to which making music in groups can ha enhance um, aspects of well-being, but also enhance physical health. We've been working with um, uh, so-called cancer choirs in the UK, looking at the extent to which singing can enhance uh, aspects of immune function, as well as um, uh, um, uh, psychological well-being among uh, cancer patients and their carers. Uh, we've just started, a, st we're just starting a new project which is funded by the Arts Council in England, looking at the extent to which making music is good for bonding between mothers and infants, and also as a way of combating postnatal depression. One of the, the nice new projects that we've, uh, we've, we're just finishing, uh, sorry, one of the projects that we're just finishing is uh, looking at making music, in, in particular group music making, as a way to enhance the health and well-being of mental health service users. So what we've seen, in fact, is that over a six-week program, significant reductions in scores on depression and anxiety compared with the control group. We've seen significant enhancements in, in aspects of social resilience. Uh, all of those findings across six weeks have held and in fact increased over through to 10 weeks and on retest three months later the, those findings were also there above and above beyond our control groups. But it's not just about uh, aspects of uh, mental well-being but also uh, biological health. So we were uh, with this particular sample taking um, uh, saliva samples before and after the training and in fact what we were seeing is enhancements in immune function over the course of the 10-week training program. Uh, the reason why we do this is because uh, we, we, we know with some theories of depression that uh, depression is linked to uh, some disorders of, of, the immu of immune function and so we were looking specifically at uh, uh, biomarkers that indicate an anti-inflammatory profile and we found significant um, uh, changes there. So these are all areas in which we are looking to use performance science to interact and to impact upon society. I'm not going to talk about any of that anymore this evening. Rather, what I'll talk about is one er other area of a grand challenge, which is stress and performance stress. We know that stress is a major problem in the workplace. It's a major reason why people are absent from working. Uh, it's also a major reason why people may develop cardiovascular problems and other ill health and, and um, uh, issues that can, that can lead to a direct impact on the economy, uh, not just in terms of um, the extent to which people use the healthcare system and may put a drain on the healthcare system, but also the extent to which they're productive in the workplace. 
And what I would like to say to you is that music and music performance is a particularly good lens through which we can study this issue. And we can do it well because musicians are constantly putting themselves under pressure on stage in front of people. We don't have to artificially create this in a laboratory. They do it to themselves all the time. So as long as we've got the right equipment and measures to come in to, to capture that, we can really um, uh, further our understanding of the basic process of stress itself. And moreover, once we do that, we can see how people respond well to it and feed that back into the way in which we train musicians to, to combat and manage stress. So what I'll talk about this evening um, is a general introduction into why performance matters. I'll also present some results from three very short studies, two of which have been published already, uh, that have led our uh, thinking and uh, provided some very nice results into where we're going with this research. And then I'll, I'll end with um, an educational, a new educational initiative that's looking to um, train the uh, change the way that we train musicians and also help them manage stress and perform better. So, performance matters. I'll start off with a very well-known uh, set of findings uh, published in 1993 by Anders Ericsson in the journal Psychological Review. And <coughs> you'll all have come across this before, but it's the notion about the accumulation of practice time to achieve levels of expertise. So, and the, the notion is generally is that about 10,000 hours of really deliberate practice are needed in order to reach those lofty heights of the experts. We find across the fields of chess and acting and sports and music and so on that this is a pretty robust and consistent finding. But 10,000 hours isn't the point at which people are given their, their cards to become great musicians. This is usually a minimum uh, uh, amount of time it takes for musicians. Um, one thing that I'll point out in this, uh, this particular graph, so we have the estimated practice hours over here and this is from the uh, this is ranging from zero to ten thousand and above and then we have the age in years on the bottom axis from four years old all the way up to 20 and with the the pianists who um, provided these data for the Erickson study what they found initially was that the amount of time that people spend practicing even starts to separate the groups the the experts from the amateurs from as young as six years old and by the time you get to 20 years old, there's a huge chasm between the amount of time that the experts have just been doing it versus the amateurs who haven't been doing it quite so much. So if you'll bear with me, I'd like to pervert this graph a little uh, to make three points. So the first point is that if you look at this relationship, what you could wrongly assume is that all you need to do is just to put in the time. It's really just a matter of accumulating those hours. But of course, it's not a matter of just accumulating those hours. It's got to be the right hours. You have to practice with high quality. Quantity isn't going to do it for you. So it's not just about quantity. The second way that one could misread this graph is that if we remove our amateurs altogether and just look at the trajectory for our experts, it could just look as if it's practice and only practice that puts you up uh, at the level of experts. But what we actually see in educational research and otherwise is that there are a number of interpersonal catalysts, personality characteristics, the size of your hands, the height if you're a bas basketball player, uh, and many, many other characteristics that will distinguish your road to expertise versus someone else's. There are also a number of environmental catalysts that come into play and that will affect how you go on to this road. So as a musician, are you exposed to the right teachers and the, to perhaps the right summer programs, uh, the right sort of ensembles and orchestras and so on? And these will come in to have positive and negative effects in that trajectory up to expertise all the way through. Of course, what we also know is that there's a lot of good and bad luck that comes along the way. So my second point really is that it's not really just only about practice, but there are many, many, a multitude of other factors that can come in to influence your uh, acquisition of expertise. And the last point that I'd like to make is that it looks like once you get on the track, it's a pretty smooth ascent up to the top. And in fact, what we do see is that it's nothing anywhere near that. 
getting up to very high levels of performance is tough. You can have good days and bad days. You can have good years and bad years. You can progress and you can go back. And even for the most practiced of performers, we find that they have to deal with stress and anxiety, a lack of confidence sometimes that can really undermine their careers. If you look across the careers and the, the biographies of great musicians like Callas, Caruso, Casals, Godofsky, Paderewski, Rachmaninoff, the list goes on, you'll find that each of these great musicians had real problems with performance anxiety and the stress that may have generated that anxiety. The office space, when, when musicians of that, that stature are showing up to work, they show up here at London's Wigmore Hall, they show up at, on the stage at La Scala, they also show up on the stage here in Montreal. And the issue really for people who have such tremendous problems with stress is that rather than seeing this as an occasion to showcase their skills and to bring pleasure to thousands of people, they see it as a threatening situation. So the seventh division, they've got their armor pointed at you, and if you miss that note, they're gonna fire. And that's, that's the, the sort of negative thinking that can lead to a downward spiral and a very bad uh, interaction with stress and anxiety. Well, so um, in 2012, I had a, a great opportunity to work with um, the concert pianist Melvin Tan. Melvin is a graduate of the Royal College of Music. He spends half his, day, half his year in London and half his year in Singapore, and he does hundreds of concerts every year. And in 2012, he was doing a recital on the last day of the Cheltenham Music Festival. So this is a picture of the, the Pitville Pump Room in Cheltenham. It's a lovely place. It's based in the Cotswolds in England. And if you do go there, it's, it's really worth the trip. And if you don't like um, music, then you can always go for the horse racing. So it's a lovely place. So Melvin was giving this recital. It was a sold-out recital in front of 400 people. The Times uh, were there to review it, so was the Telegraph. Radio, BBC Radio 3, were, uh, they were recording it, and uh, Radio 4 were there to report on the event. So there was pressure involved. Uh, but this is part of, the, part of Melvin's everyday work, so he does this very often. What we wanted to do was to look at his program. So he was starting off with uh, English Suite Number no. 2 in A minor by Bach and then doing a new composition. Then he had an interval followed by a very long and arduous, physically arduous program in the second half. And what I'd like to do is to focus just on the first piece in this program and to illustrate how he was responding physiologically to the stress of that situation. So our basic design was that uh, we, he knew the program months in advance. We went along to his studio in London and we recorded him uh, before he ran through the program and then running through the entire program under low stress conditions. He allowed us to put a, at the time it was a, uh, quite an advanced bit of uh, um, uh, equipment, a bio harness which straps around the chest. It gives us access to the electrocardiogram, um, also to breathing rate and to uh, skin temperature and so on. So this is a wireless device that we could put next to his skin, under his clothes, that would allow us to monitor what's going on in his body as he's playing through his program. And then we went along to Cheltenham with the sold-out concert. We strapped them up again, and we monitored, and we collected the same data with the same program. So what I'd like to show you is the result focusing on um, the, the low-stress London rehearsal versus the high-stress Cheltenham performance. And the first place I'll start is heart rate because it's quite an easy thing and it's quite nicely illustrative. Um, what we see here is that uh, when he's sitting at baseline, his heart rate's ticking away at about 75 beats per minute. Before he ran, he started his program, uh, it accelerated just a little bit. And then under the low stress conditions, again, while he's playing the piece, his heart rate is around 83 beats per minute. So this is entirely predictable and what you would expect. So he's sitting around doing nothing. He's a 50-something-year-old man, and his heart rate is 
uh, coming in in the mid-70s. And then as he goes through and he's performing this program, his heart rate accelerates a little bit. And that's under the low stress condition. And what we find under high stress conditions is a really radically different scenario altogether. So under the, at, in the pre-performance period, his heart rate is ticking away on average at about 120 beats per minute. And as he walks on stage and is playing through his program, it settles down a little bit, but it's still very high at about 115 beats per minute. So he's not jumping around. He's not a rock musician. He's sitting on a piano stool playing a well-known program that he could play very well. And we have this huge difference between the low stress and the high stress situation. Now this is where psychology comes in, and it's very important to know this. Uh, in terms of anxiety and reported anxiety, Melvin was not scoring very high. He was, it, was pretty, uh, it was a little bit on the high side, but it was fairly normal. And the, the situation is that he, he described this as the, the sort of feeling of, its of excitement and the buzz that he has before performance is a signal that he's ready to perform. It's not a signal that something bad is going to happen. So the interpretation of this change makes a huge difference to what happens when people are thinking and delivering their performance on stage. Well, uh, as I said before, heart rate's a very simple measure, and of course, this can be affected by fitness levels, it can be affected by genetics, and so on. So when you're looking at the ECG, the electrocardiogram, you're often uh, looking at something uh, in stress called heart rate variability, and the, st the standard statistics that one uses for heart rate variability is the so-called RR, which is the amount of time between peak uh, beats of the heart. And here we find that uh, a lower reading means the heart is beating faster, and this is what's coming in in the high-stress performance. And a higher reading mean that means that the heart is beating slower, and so this is coming in in the low stress performance. But what we also see, the other standard statistic is the standard deviation of RR. And typically, again, we see that under the high stress situation, the standard deviation goes down. So usually with heart rate variability, there's less variability within high stress situations. So this is exactly what we would expect to find. But again, these are very simple measures, and when it comes to heart rate variability, it's often good to back away from the temporal aspects and look at the, f the, the, the spectral aspects, the, the, the frequencies that are being seen. <coughs> when one does that, you can look at the so-called low frequencies versus the high frequencies within the heart rate signal. And low frequencies are believed to be associated with an arousal of the system. And high frequencies are usually associated with bringing that system back to normal. So if you make a ratio between the low frequencies and the high frequencies, you get a fairly standard indication of how stressed people are. So this is called the low frequency, high frequency ratio. And this is what we found in the data. So we again, we have our higher ratios should be an indication of higher stress. And our black line is the high stress condition, and the gray line is the low stress condition. So this was a little bit puzzling. We thought, well, according to this, it looks as though after he gets to a certain point, about 600 seconds into the first piece, his low frequency, high frequency ratio changes, and it looks almost as if he's more relaxed on stage with 400 people than he was with no one around in London. So we, this is where the collaboration with other people like signal, processi signal processing specialists and electrical engineers becomes very handy. We, thought we started to think, well, maybe there's something wrong with the low-frequency, high-frequency ratio. Maybe we want to try another set of mathematics to see if we can actually understand the stress response better. And so we looked at an area uh, broadly labeled complexity science, and we, we looked at something called complexity loss theory. So living systems adapt to their environment, and they produce long-range correlations of physiological responses. And the low-frequency and high-frequency ratio does not account for what happens in these long-range correlations. So of course it's the case that if you're nervous now, in five minutes, the extent to which you're nervous now is going to influence the data that we collect from you in five minutes. But the low-frequency, high-frequency ratio does not allow us to understand that. And a certain type of uh, complexity analysis called multi-scale sample entropy 
does allow us to do that. It, l it allows us to take account for how uh, the dynamical complexity across time. And studies in the laboratory looking at complexity of physiological signals have shown that when, when biological organisms are under physical constraint, maybe they're, uh, they're exerting themselves, they're ill or perhaps uh, under issues of uh, conditions of aging, what that indicates usually is that complexity reduces under states of high stress. So let's go back to our heart rate variability and our standard analysis. And what we see here is this very confusing overlap of the stress response between a high stress situation and a low stress situation. And when we apply our new multi-scale sample entropy analysis, what we find is and a very clear distinction between the physiological response under the high stress black uh, uh, line and the lower stress gray line. And again, complexity is lower under stress or under duress. If you'd like to read more about the, uh, the mathematics behind this and also the, uh, the, uh, the basic study design, we've published this paper in uh, one of the journals of the Royal Society called Interface. So what I would put to you is that by studying real live stress response in real time, through musical performance, which is a perfectly natural, ecologically valid way of doing it, we're able to further our understanding of how to analyze stress in humans. So that was a study of n equals 1. So in study 2, what we aim to do is to see whether this uh, actually does hold up when we include more people. Uh, we also wanted to look at this key and somewhat intriguing finding of this very high level of stress that we were seeing in the pre-performance period under, under um, in, in the Cheltenham performance. <coughs> so for this study, I picked another lovely location uh, in which to collect data. This was Lugano. I would highly recommend going there as well. I don't think they have horse racing, but they have many other things that you can do. So this is in uh, southern Switzerland, just across the border from Milan. And what we did, we recruited 11 violinists and six flute players and we imposed a uh, solo piece by Bach on both groups, uh, an allemand from two separate uh, partitas. And we strapped them up with the bioharness again. We looked at their ECG data in the pre-performance period, and we looked at the ECG data in an actual low-stress performance. Basically, it was an empty practice room that they could run through that, that piece. Then we invited in some audition panelists who were going to listen to each player and, they had and the players had to perform the same piece under high stress conditions. So if we look at our low frequency, high frequency ratio again, what we find here is an effect of time but no effect of performance. So as far as this ratio is concerned, it gives us an indication that red is high stress and blue is low stress, that before performance, there's some degree of peak level physiological arousal that's happening. So people's bodies are really kicking in, and by the time they get onto stage, things tend to settle down a little bit. But again, we've got this confusing finding where it looks as if the physiological response under low stress and high stress conditions are ex exactly the same. So when we apply the multi-scale sample entropy to these same data, Again, lower means more complex, and it means more stress, usually. So what we find is the, the very predictable interaction that we expected. So we find that, indeed, before people start, we see peak levels of physiological stress at that point. By the time they get out onto stage, things begin to settle down a little bit, but there's a definite difference between how the body is reacting under the low-stress situation represented by the blue line and the high-stress situation represented by the red line. So for me, and I think in terms of designing interventions to help people overcome stress, it suggests that this backstage area, while people are waiting to perform, while people are waiting to give a public lecture, uh, this is the point at which we can begin to analyze level of stress and also perhaps intervene to help people combat that and manage stress levels better. So those data aren't yet published, but uh, we'll soon be submitting those. 
Okay, and then finally, uh, in, in the last study that I want to mention, we decided that, well, the heart rate and the ECG, ECG data, it's really a rather easy target. Let's start looking into other systems in the body that begin to elucidate the stress response. And one of the main uh, systems that we can look at, pathways, is the, the so-called HPA axis. So if you have stress, then there are various uh, interactions of the brain which will set off a chain reaction of releasing uh, CRH. We also see a response from the pituitary gland and the adrenal cortex, all the way to a point at which we discover in the body uh, glucocorticoids, which are reflective of stress. So the main stress hormones that we tend to look at when we are uh, analyzing um, saliva samples or bloods or whatever will be cortisol and cortisone. So on this occasion, uh, we uh, we stayed in London this time, and we we had a uh, we knew that we there was a particular concert coming up with um, conducted by um, Eric Whitaker, the composer, and he was working with uh, 19 elite level singers, and they were going to be delivering a concert of his music in front of an audience of 610 people. So the venue was uh, Union Chapel in London, which is in Islington. So 15 of our people uh, gave usable samples of saliva, and what we did is that we went through in the dress rehearsal evening the night before the concert, and we col collected a, sa a sample of saliva at 7.30, and then one more at 8.30. <coughs> and in the high-stress performance situation, when there were um, 600 uh, audience members waiting for the performance. We also, at 7.30, uh, collected a saliva sample before the high-stress performance, and then at 8.30, which was the, the interval for the concert. And what we found here are fairly, fairly predictable uh, findings. Uh, with regard to um, the low-stress condition, actually, we find that stress hormones were significantly lowered and uh, they, they reduced from across that time. So in fact, although that we, we can actually imagine that doing a dress rehearsal the night before a big concert is, is a potentially stressful thing, what we were seeing is that among these elite singers, they were actually more relaxed after the rehearsal than before it. And of course, if you look at the high stress response, then we see a significant increase in that, uh, in that situation from before to after. So there was more cortisol and cortisone in the system. But very often for looking at stress, it's not just a matter of looking at individual biomarkers. And one common measure of stress with biomarkers is the ratio for cortisol to cortisone. And this is what was intriguing. So across the, the low stress condition, we saw, as you would expect, a significant reduction in the cortisol-cortisone ra uh, ratio. So even for these highly skilled people who are just about to do a, a performance the night before, we see that singing actually is potentially quite relaxing and good for them. And in the high stress situation, we saw a reduction of this ratio, but not a significant one. But nonetheless, this is quite an interesting set of results that suggests that you know, certainly singing, uh, as we know from other studies, can be potentially very good for you. One mechanism for that is to help relax you, perhaps, as indicated by cortisol and cortisone. And that's even the case for highly skilled singers. And we just published these, uh, these results in September. Uh, in Frontier, so that's the, uh, the DOI, if you'd like to read that. Well, so we're, we're in this situation where we know that performing is really radically different physiologically than practicing. We also know that performance anxiety and the fear of performance is something that's quite common among musicians. We also know that the pre-performance period is a particularly sensitive time where performers of most types will become especially anxious, perhaps, and they'll certainly have a, a huge reaction physiologically to the stress that they're enduring. So what can we do about it, and why is it the case? Why is practicing and performing so different? And it becomes very obvious if you just look in the places in which people do their practicing. 
our musicians at the RCM will spend a lot of time, in fact, they'll fight very vociferously to get access to one of these boring rooms. But while they're there, they may be working very hard and, and getting their Rachmaninoff concerto down, but the assumption is that they will be able to translate what they learn in this space seamlessly over into this space. And I think that's a wrong assumption. We just have to look at this a few times. So this is the, this is the Royal Festival Hall in London, newly refurbished, and yeah, so everything about these situations are very different. So we do a lot of learning in these dull places, and we do a lot of performing in these really rich and vibrant places. But musicians aren't the only ones who have to bridge this gap. Athletes are going to be practicing there and performing there. And surgeons will, you certainly hope, will be practicing a lot there, and they have to perform there. Business people, they'll be perform uh, learning there and performing there. And what we see across many of our performance domains is that the, the situations in which we practice and learn are pretty dull and there's low risk. And the place where we put under the spotlight is entirely dynamic and a very different environment altogether. And it's also extremely risky. What will happen, of course, here at the School of Music, at the Royal College of Music and elsewhere, is that we try for, for students to bridge that gap. We build recital halls and concert halls to allow them to get time on stage. But it's still very difficult to bridge that gap entirely. And so one, a, a few years ago, I decided, well, I'd like to get some students onto a major London stage to practice. They need to practice their performing and not just practice their practicing. They're, they're very often coming out with degrees in performance, so how can we enhance this process? So I called up a major London uh, concert hall, and I said, I'd like to rent the hall, please. So there was almost no availability, but there was perhaps a very early morning slot that I could book out. The price tag was in the four digits, and that didn't come with an audience or a cup of coffee or anything else, so it, it wasn't really going to work for us financially. Uh, and moreover, it wouldn't really approximate the dynamic interaction that the performer has while on stage. So I, I then called up some colleagues in the medical faculty at Imperial College who train surgeons, and I wanted to find out how they train surgeons to deal with the real-life stress of, of operations. And of course, you really do want your surgeon to be highly practiced before they practice on patients. And so, of course, they're in, in surgery and in other fields like in, in uh, flying and uh, uh, aerial navigation, there have been the, the use of uh, simulators for quite some time. And they have a very well-equipped surgical operational uh, simulator at, at Imperial College. The problem is that it's, it's a very expensive facility to build, and it's also a very expensive facility to run. And these things tend to come in, uh, well, not only do they cost a lot, but they, they, they tend to, in a way, impair the training of the performer because when, when surgeons go into a simulator, they're going to expect the worst because it's about dealing with problems. So one of the solutions to this at Imperial College is that they've, they've come up with um, portable, low-cost simulators where they can have students, because it's low cost, they can erect these things almost anywhere, and students can engage with the act of surgical performance and train as they're working through. And they can open up this space so that the, 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 the public can actually look in. So what they've done is they've, they've generated an inflatable operating theater. The students who are going to be practicing the operation will go through the standard procedures of scrubbing up and gowning up uh, and they have a team around them. But instead of having, say, uh, a piece of equipment that costs a million dollars in the background that's just going bing and the, the, stu the surgical student never actually deals with it, they just put a life-size picture of the machine and they play the bing into the room and then the students never really notice that it's just a picture. And this is a technique called distributed simulation. You give people just enough cues to draw them into the performance state of mind, but you approximate those cues in the way that can allow you to make a portable and low-cost simulation. 
well, I thought, great, we'll have a um, uh, we'll have an inflatable concert hall, and we'll we'll let our students go there. The problem with that idea was that the, the inflatable walls make too much noise. You've got a fan going in the background all the time, so we couldn't go down that route. But what we've done instead is to convert one of our standard rooms into a multi-layered and, and interactive performance space. So we've called this a performance simulator. Uh, but before any student ever reaches that room, they will be assigned a performance time. And when they show up to the performance venue, they'll be shown to a green room by a, a real backstage manager. And in that green room, they do whatever they need to do to prepare. The backstage manager will come in and give them a 30-minute warning, or a 30-minute stage call, and then a 15-minute, five-minute, and then we ask the performer to come along with the stage manager. Now, we might, during this whole time, strap on some bio-harnesses so we, we can look at their ECG data. We can also take some saliva samples. Of course, they fill in some questionnaires as well. And then they walk into our backstage area. And in the backstage area, we require them to stand around for quite a, a few minutes while the backstage manager checks that the front of house is ready. They, the backstage manager will go through a very scripted, formalized protocol that is the same that they would find at any performance, international performance uh, venue. It's all fake and made up. Uh, what we're doing in this area is requiring the student to stand around so that we can collect enough ECG data so that we've got good quality uh, recordings. And while they're back there, they have access to CCTV footage, which is, we don't point that out to them, but uh, that's there for the backstage manager to ensure that the front of house is ready for the performer to walk through. And at the appointed time, the backstage manager turns to the musician, asks if the musician is ready. If so, then opens the door and they go out and they're hit with spotlights and they're greeted by an interactive virtual audience. So I brought my audience with me. I'll just switch over to them. So this is our, s our fake CCTV footage that's playing on a small screen in the back of the, uh, of, of the backstage area. Here, uh, it doesn't really matter what's showing. What we can do is overhear the murmur of the audience. We've inserted a clock which is counting up. It's not even counting down. It's completely meaningless, but it does give the sense that time is moving on. <laughs> and when we're ready to, to walk through, we confirm that the performer is ready we switch over. If we can turn the volume up a little bit. Okay, so we, we walk out and they're applauding for us and we can, uh, we take our bow and we, you can, uh, they're a little bit big here but they're more like the life size in our actual performance simulator. And you can only see these, three, these people through the glare of the spotlights that are coming at you. We have uh, some control of over the temperature in the room as well. So they keep applauding until whoever's in the backstage area decides to tell them to stop. Okay, um, and if we keep the volume up, that's good. Uh, so, now, this is a fairly well-behaved Western classical audience. They're moving around a little bit. <coughs> but, of course, you could be just about ready to start your unaccompanied Bach uh, suite. <coughs> and somebody sneezes. <coughs> or you're right at that very delicate point in performance. <coughs> more coughing. <coughs> the phone could go off. And so on and so forth. There we go. So depending on how uh, mean we want to be, we can actually put a number of disturbances into the performance. And we can see how these disturbances directly impact on things like the physiology. So we can trace that through. Of course, we've got very time, good time codes. And we can see how that increased level of engagement may directly impact on someone's physiology. Now, of course, as I said, they're a fairly well-behaved Western classical audience. Uh, at the end of your performance, if you've done a terrific job, then they'll respond to you like this. Hello. 
And so in that time, you will have taken your bow. You may have walked off stage and be, been called back onto stage to take another bow and so on. Now, and the whole time that you're out there, we have cameras trained onto you so that you can review that footage later. You can share that footage with a teacher or other colleagues to, to look not only at how well you perform musically, but how well you're communicating that performance, how confident you look, um, and, and, and a range of other features. If you have uh, done exceptionally well in your performance, then they'll respond to you like this. So you can see why I take them everywhere. Um, one of the ways in which uh, w one of the ways in which they can respond, which isn't so great, would be this. <laughs> that one's harder to switch off for some reason. Um, so we have a number of scenarios, and what we can do is g allow students to develop their own training programs. We give them access to the video footage. We also can work with them through repeated exposure to see if we begin to increase the stress level and the number of distractions, or in fact decrease it. And as a result of this, we can use this as a facility to, to study stress reactivity, but also st stress recovery. So how quickly people get back to normal after they're exposed to high levels of stress. So as far as stress goes, this is a pretty easy scenario, and I'll just switch them off. And I'd like to introduce you to a, another group of people. So these are our experts. And of course, we always care what the experts have to say. And here, it's very important to give people, again, that chance to practice their auditioning, because they're going to have to do it very often, and how they manage that situation is a, 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 a very crucial point to whether they win a job or a certain entry into a college or so on. So, as with the last simulation, we absolutely make sure that people do not see the panel until the backstage manager is ready to send them in. The panel is ready for you, it's not when you're ready for the panel. So when you're given the all clear and we open the door, then you walk in. Hello? Please, sir, start whenever you are ready. So you could be doing anything at this point. You could be uh, uh, doing your, your orchestral excerpts or maybe a dance routine. Perhaps you've got a business pitch that you'd like to get across to these people. Now, they will listen. Th their, their greeting is always the same. It's always, hello, please start whenever you're ready. And at that point, I can decide to make them like you, be indifferent to you, or actually dislike you. And so I've made them start to like you You'll see, in fact, we're getting some smiles here. The chair, he's a little bit more reserved, so he doesn't give ev everything away at, at first. But throughout this, he will come to like you very much. And this is, uh, th this is filmed in five-minute loops. It will keep going forever until we decide to stop them. Now, at the end of your successful audition, they'll say something like this. Thank you. That was excellent. Wasn't it? Yeah. Absolutely lovely. Well done. Thank you. And the door opens, and you walk out. Uh, however, it's not always quite like that. I'll skip the intro and just jump straight to the negative response. This one is, well, they're already starting to talk in the middle of your audition. Uh, this one is actually worth watching the whole way through. We won't because of time, uh, but they really do get quite perturbed and irate. And at the end of this horrific audition, they'll give you this response. Yeah. 
thank you for coming. Or it could be worse. Thank you. I think we've heard enough. <laughs> what we're actually seeing is independent of how well an audition or a performance went, the sort of response and feedback that we trigger as part of these simulations can really take a toll on how people recover from stress. So a negative reaction from that panel will take about twice as long for your body to recover from stress than a positive reaction. And that's also a, a, a very interesting point where with interventions we can come in to intervene to, to try to help people recover more quickly from stressful instances and then move on to the next performance when they can. So we have our audience, we have our panel. We just, uh, we're just now, uh, this month, coming up with a much more, or a much less civil uh, press conference simulation. These people do not worry in the least bit about talking over your performance or over what you're having to say at the press conference. We also have flash bulbs going off, people walking out of the room, and so on and so forth. I think what's, what's interesting for us is we, we, we're seeing simulation being used from our students, and at this point we've had around 300 students roll through the simulation, and many come back to use it time and again. It's a service that we offer out through, through to all of our students. We're seeing them use this technology in a way that is very well suited for their particular needs. In some cases, they're using it to enhance their musical skills. In other cases, their technical skills, their communicative skills, and also, of course, the obvious uh, issue of trying to manage stress and anxiety. And we, we're, we're now developing new initiatives where we get some one-to-one -one teaching that happens in the performance context. So we're trying to engage all, uh, as, uh, all a, a wide range of performers across the college to g get them to learn in performance situations. Some of the new initiatives that we're doing is working with the executive education team at the Imperial College Business School to try to get executives who are dealing with public speaking also to look at how they present themselves when they're delivering a lecture and so on. And it's that's an area where it's really very exciting because we are able to look across different disciplines and domains. We can actually try to enhance their performance, but by, by coming up with ways of studying their performance, we feed that back into how we train musicians. And on that basis, uh, just to quote our audition panel, I think you've probably heard enough. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>